1. One fine summer day. I was in line at Starbucks after a workout. The line crept forward. In front of the line, just before the register, was an open pathway for people going to the left to wait for their drinks, or to the right to go to the bathroom. Parallel to the line on our left was a long table, and to the right were bookshelves filled with coffee mugs. This created a blocked-in queue to keep everyone funneling forward. Three younger women were on the bathroom side of the bookshelves out of line, chatting and picking up cups before they realized that the line was moving forward, and people were also getting behind me. But instead of getting in the now longer line, they tried to casually drift around the bookshelves into the open aisle in front of me, acting like they were intent on looking at the cups. Ladies, the line actually starts back there, I said in my most chipper school marm voice, and the girl who was the ringleader said, well, we were all ready, before I cut her off and said, yep, it's back there, excuse me. I moved past them and put my order in before moving to the left side. Since the place was packed, we all waited a while to get our drinks. While in line and in the waiting area, the three girls alternated looking at their phones, shooting dirty looks at me, and whispering amongst themselves. I managed to make out the words fat and rolls, and one even pulled up a remixed audio of a pig squeal, which apparently was louder than they thought it would be because they shushed each other and kept giggling, then giggled louder as I exited. I'm a plus-sized woman, so I was a bit upset, but it wasn't anything I hadn't experienced before. My employer runs a relatively coveted internship program. Interesting industry, great location in a major metro area, good word of mouth, etc. For first-year students going into my field, we typically accept 10 interns out of roughly 200 applicants. Five volunteers supervise the interns, and one of the five also acts as the head intern wrangler. This particular year, I was the head intern wrangler, and I walked into the meeting the day after my Starbucks run to find that one of my ten interns was Miss Pigsqueal. I sat down, facing all of them, introduced myself, and she did a double take and went as white as a sheet and looked more and more unhappy as I explained that I was in charge, that we would be sitting down together to discuss their career goals, and they should work hard with the view of getting a reference in mind. I did what any normal person would do, pretend like I didn't know who Miss Pigsquill was for the entire internship, and gaslight her with kindness. The nicer I was to her, the more uncomfortable she became, especially since I apparently have her dream job and her dream life. If her resume and personal statement are any indication, she spent ten weeks avoiding me in the hallway and waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it never did. Every time I said something positive, be it telling her that her work product was fine or saying something like, cool necklace, I could see the wheels turning in her head. I didn't mess with her livelihood over it, but looking back at it, it gives me the warm fuzzies in the place where my heart is supposed to be. 2. Hey everyone, this is my first post. This happened several years ago when I was in a very popular community college. I basically became an unofficial counselor for other students around my age, given my vast knowledge of how to fulfill requirements and create scheduling, that not only focused on their community college schedule, but non-education obligations as well. I did this for close to 100 plus people within a period of a few weeks. Everyone in the community loved me as a result of that. I'm a loner and didn't do this for attention or anything. Given this community college was extremely popular, acquiring any class, let alone a course with a good teacher and time, was beyond difficult. It got to the point where people were selling spots in classes for anywhere between 10 and 200 plus dollars. Keep in mind, this is just to get the class on your schedule. You still need to pay your class fees to the community college. I saw how much people needed help, so with a combination of my own determination and free time, and people's like and trust in me, given all I did for them, I was able to acquire hundreds of classes. One could obviously only keep a certain amount of classes at a time, so I would get a few, give the spots away, and start this process over again. I understand that the overwhelming majority of people who came up to me just wanted to use me, not actually establish a connection. That's fine. I am a loner, and prefer it that way. 
I hate dishonesty more than anything, so I keep to myself. This guy, friends and I called him Rat for irrelevant reasons, comes up to me and starts to develop a friendship. After hanging out with him for six months, we became very close to the point we start sharing our deepest fears and medical issues. He needed some classes and I just happened to have them extra. I gave them to him for free, obviously. Approximately two weeks later I received proof in various forums from other students that Rat effectively faked a friendship for six months, made up fake issues and illnesses to share with me in an attempt to get free classes from me. This proof was screenshots at first, Facebook group chat of him bragging that he pulled one over on me, and when people showed it to me I didn't believe them. I had so much trust in him given the extent of our friendship that I asked them to record their phone call with him saying it. It's harder to fake voice and screenshots. So one of the people whose schedule I helped immensely took it upon herself to one, purchase a phone recording app subscription, she already ran out of free trials, Two, use the fact that Rat liked her to get him to admit over a recorded phone call that he played me. I sincerely appreciated the fact that she informed me. If he would have just asked me from the beginning without having to fake a friendship, I would have given it to him. The fact he chose to waste my time for months and played me like a fiddle got me hot and bothered. So one day he left his laptop open and I dropped all of his classes that I gave him, so all of them, right before an important community college deadline. He asked me if it was me, and I told him I don't have his info, which isn't a lie, just a bending of the truth since I didn't want to confront him and just end it as is, which he believed because I rarely lie. He was delayed another semester and had to bundle classes together just to transfer in two years, which made it harder for him, rightfully so. Was it right of me to drop the classes I gave him for free? Probably not. Was it petty revenge? 100%. 3. I started working for a company many years ago. I worked hard, did extra work, and worked overtime regularly. They were always short-staffed. I worked an average of three days as overtime. After a year and a half, I was supposed to get promoted. Met with the manager... He went over the checklist and said I meet all the requirements, but wouldn't give me my promotion. He said I worked too much overtime on other shifts. To me, that was a weird statement as why does that matter? I'm helping the company out. Apparently the managers from all three shifts didn't like each other and hated when one of their workers worked overtime on someone else's shift. I didn't know all this, as I don't get caught up in gossip. This was more of a shock to me as I came from a company that believed in working as a team and what's best for the company. I worked to help the company and its customers, also the extra money was nice. I continue to work as I did because I'm not giving up the extra money. What I make in overtime is a lot more than the promotion raise. As my department has a budget given to them, the manager's bonus depends on if they go over it affects their bonus. Well, part of my benefits include tuition towards school. I enrolled into an online master's program. I picked a college where they offer our company a discount towards their tuition. This helped me take four classes a year instead of three without going over my max allowance. I started taking classes. Other co-workers noticed I would do schoolwork during downtime. I worked the overnight shift, so there was always downtime. I started to encourage others to go back to school also. They could even take a certificate program. I told them companies don't care about us and can get rid of us at any time, but can never take away our education. Eventually, like ten of us, were in school eating into their budget. Managers are panicking as they know they will go over and their bonus will be affected. They can't stop us from using our company benefits, and they can't stop the OT as we need adequate staff to do the work. To be even more petty... I wouldn't pick overtime on his shift when he was really short-handed. Others were in classes and wouldn't pick up overtime when it was really short either, and knew it could be a lot of work that day. So his metrics would fall. We had a rule, no enforced overtime, so he couldn't make people work overtime on his shift. For the next few years, they went over on their budget and my manager had the worst metrics out of the three of them. So his bonus was cut the most. 
It took another year, but I finally got my promotion. He tried to stop it, but I had filed a complaint with my director stating I qualify for my promotion to next level as I hit all my qualifications. They reviewed and agreed. I got my promotion within the month. He would ask me every year if I was planning on using my tuition benefit, which I said of course. After four years, I finished my master's program. He seemed relieved until I told him I was planning on doing a second degree. He was pissed and tried to stop me. I had a meeting with HR and asked them to show me where in the policy it states I can use it for one program only or a max amount I qualify for. They couldn't and told my manager I was eligible to use the tuition benefits as much as I like as long as the school and program meets the company requirements. I never went over the yearly and I finished my third master's degree before leaving the company on a volunteer buyout. 4. This comes back from when I was working security in a local hospital. The hospital itself was made up of a main building, accident and emergency, minors and wars, estates office, old ambulance station, the maternity ward and the management house, which would house all of the upper management while they worked. Around the building were car parks. We had nine in total, ranging from large to only a couple of spaces, but still a wide area. It would take around 30 to 40 minutes to check all the car parks, and take 10 to 15 minutes to get to one side of the site edge to the other. Our security office was located just outside of A&E, as believe it or not, that was where most of the trouble was, which called for security to be there. As a fairly small hospital, there was only a maximum of three security on each eight-hour shift. Security management could help, but often didn't want to get involved. We were doing our normal patrols of once every 30 minutes to go around each of the wards, which kept us quite busy if nothing was happening that day on shift. One day, a nurse complained to the security manager that we need to be more visible around the car parks to stop break-ins. We don't often patrol the car parks as it's park at your own risk, as the site was lacking funds for extra security. Our manager understood this, which was why it just stayed as it was, due to the security team needing to stay in the wards and A&E to protect staff and patients. Six months go by, and our manager leaves. He is replaced with a new manager who hears the same complaint as the first one, and orders us to start patrolling each and every car park and ward on our rounds. Needless to say, we just agreed and said okay. Please note, I know this would not end well, but I complied with my new orders and every day without fail, walked around all the car parks, even if it was half or nearly empty. Fast forward another week or two, and A&E radioed us to attend as a patient was threatening staff. However, security officers were on the back car roughly 5 to 10 minutes away, even when running. Please note that this was another rule. We had to stay in twos as we were only MAPA trained, and it needed two minimum. By the time we got there, this patient had already hit out to staff, causing injury, but also decided to run around the A&E department and other adjoining areas breaking glass windows and scaring others. We controlled the situation after getting there, but it was already too late. Thousands of pounds worth of damage caused and a couple with small injuries. Later on, our new manager asked why our response time was so slow. We just replied by saying we was taking care of the car parks like ordered to by you. The day after, more signs went up saying, park at your own risk, and we were never ordered to patrol half-empty car parks again. New manager only lasted about four or five months after this incident. 5. This was back in college about ten years ago. I had moved out to a four-year college, a real university, for my last two years of my bachelor's degree. I had a variety of roommates in off-campus housing. This one, whom the story concerns, will be referenced as accuser. I had already been in this apartment unit for a year, having had two prior roommates. Accuser moved in for my second year at this place. I had already set up a variety of media devices to the TV with my own cables, VHS and DVD player. I had some old movies I liked. Both hooked up with my HDMI cords. Accuser asks after a few days if he can swap around the cords to use his PlayStation. I was fine with it, 
So I said, cool, just plug my stuff back in when you're done. He never did. After ten months I got petty, I took all of my devices and locked them in my cabinets, along with the cords. I only pulled them out when I wanted to use them, and used my PC monitor so that he wouldn't have access. Accuser starts complaining to the resident assistant, who is just a student getting free housing in exchange for helping manage the place and residence. The RA comes in and has a talk with both of us. Accuser accuses me of stealing his HDMI cords. I deny that they were his and the RA doesn't believe me. So at his urging, I get one of my two cords, the older one, and give it to Accuser who is smug the whole time. Cue petty revenge. First I did two weeks of the silent treatment, not a single word was spoken from me to him. If he asked me something I would ignore it. Even if he got in my face I would ignore him. Stood in front of me in the hallway, I just sit next to the wall until he moved. After two weeks, we had a meeting with the RA again, and I told him, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm cleaning, ensuring responsible use of shared restroom. I'm just not talking, which is my right. The RA agreed with me, so this continued for another three months. Cue more petty revenge. The day of accuser's move-out came. I was staying in the house over the summer, despite graduating, just to wrap up some extra coursework I wanted to take to help round out my education. As Accuser is packing, he asks me for help. I comply and begin packing his PlayStation and other stuff in the living room. What he didn't know is I carry a multi-tool almost all the time. I use the pliers to bend the hell out of the HDMI cord, both ends. He never reaches out about the cord, just moved out, and that's the last I hear from him. But I know he opened that box and had to be fuming that he would finally have to buy his own cord. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 278. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do boop the like button and share the video with friends and family. If you'd like to get the videos a little bit earlier, you can support the channel and me through Patreon for as little or as much as you like per month. The link to that is in the description. You can also buy Hellfreezer merchandise if you'd like to. That is also linked in the description. Get yourself some lovely, sexy Hellfreezer merchandise for the summer. All right, it's lovely, maybe not sexy. I make no guarantees about that. And you can also make donations during streams and videos like this one on a one-off basis if you wish to do. While this is not required, it is certainly super appreciated. All right, I don't think there's any other business today, so we'll move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... All right, do you have a preference for old, well-made antique furniture, kind of thing that's really heavy, but it's going to last a long time, and generally looks very ornate and gorgeous? Or do you much more prefer the aesthetic of the kind of flat pack thing you buy from you know, numerous stores, buy it from, you know, from Ikea, get it from Amazon, wherever, and you get it delivered to you, or bring it home yourself, and assemble it yourself, sometimes with a little, a little tool you might even get in the pack. These both have their benefits, and certainly the flat pack stuff has its has its pluses in terms of uh, cost. Uh, the desk I'm using right now is, of course, a flat pack. But I've always wanted you know, the really fancy thing, like you know, a beautiful dark stained wood uh, drawers, maybe some hidden compartments in there for, I'll never use, but it's good to know they're there. Rich, ornate, and needlessly beautiful. But for a bookshelf, quite frankly, I prefer the, pla the flat pack one because I'm going to drill holes in it anyway to secure it to the wall. And uh, I certainly prefer more modern and more comfortable sofas. Uh, not to say that the, the artisanship, the work that goes into some older material, the older, older pieces, isn't beautiful, but beautiful isn't always comfortable. I do remember one of my favorite things I owned when I was younger. It was a table I inherited from my grandfather. Uh, uh, one of the legs broke at one point, I had to repair it. I don't know where my grandfather got it from. I uh, don't know how much it cost. I do know that, however, I was very fond of it. I had this kind of black and white sort of textured pattern on top of it. And uh, I had that in my bedroom for many, many years uh, after he passed away. Um, it was important to me. But, you know, eventually wear and tear over time. And uh, I didn't quite have the, the, the resources to repair it at the time or the know-how to repair it at the time. So it had to be thrown away. 
I certainly wouldn't have had a use for it growing up. I mean, I've got my computer desk, and it wouldn't have been suitable as a computer desk. And I don't really like a central table in the living room. Uh, personally, I think it's a tripping hazard, at least it is for me, as someone who enjoys playing virtual reality. Anyway, uh, that's what I think, so let me know what you think in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.